Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, The Impacts of Hearing Loss as We Age, presented by Chesapeake Hearing Center's clinical audiologist, Dr. Tyler Ropp. I'm Jeff Stauffer, Community Relations Director with Elville and Associates, and I'll be moderating today's event. We're so pleased to have met the team at Chesapeake Hearing Centers through one of our attorneys here at Elvon Associates, a terrific organization with wonderful and caring people. And Dr. Roth has a lot of greater information to share with you this morning. This webinar is also offered in partnership with the Howard County Library System, a longtime supporter of Elvon Associates educational programs. I'd like to specifically recognize Ms. Rahini Gupta, adult curriculum specialist for our partnership over the past six years. So thank you, Rahini. I think you're on today's webinar with us. So how this will work today, if you haven't joined this before, if so, welcome, we're glad you're here. You as the attendee are in listen-only mode. However, you do have a voice. You, when you have a question, please note them in the questions panel in the right-hand portion of your screen, and we'll address all questions at the end of the presentation. You also received the pres presentation yesterday afternoon from me by email for your convenience if you want to take notes on it. Everyone will also receive a post-webinar feedback email right after the presentation, and we ask that you please just take a couple minutes to fill out this simple survey to offer us valuable feedback about the presentation. It's also an ideal time to request a consultation with one of our attorneys if you have any planning needs for your family and you. So here at Elvon Associates, Associates, we look forward to being a resource to you today and in the future. So reach out to us with any questions at any time. So at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Maris Walker, who is a patient advocate and outreach coordinator with Chesapeake Hearing Centers, who has a few words to say and will offer a proper introduction to Dr. Rob. So Maris, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. It is both my pleasure and my honor to be highly involved with this much anticipated and needed webinar event uh, titled The Impacts of Hearing Loss as We Age, presented by both our clinical audiologist, Dr. Tyler Ralph, in direct collaboration with Elville and Associates an estate planning, elder law and special needs planning law firm based in Columbia and Annapolis, with other offices in Central Maryland. Dr. Ralph received his doctorate in audiology from Towson University after completing his clinical fellowship at Chesapeake Hearing Centers. Um, he attended Penn State University as an undergraduate and received a Bachelor of Science in Communication Sciences and Disorders. Dr. Ralph received, um, oh, so sorry. Um, including the Towson University Speech and Hearing Clinic, Baltimore City School District, and the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda. He has a lot of <laughs> background. He worked as a clinical audiologist in a private practice in Philadelphia before returning to Chesapeake Hearing Centers, and we're so glad he did. His clinical interests include amplification and hearing aids, tinnitus management, and balance assessment. Dr. Ralph can be seen in both our Annapolis and Columbia offices. Uh, before I turn this over to Dr. Ralph, I wanted to say that both Chesapeake Hearing Centers and Elville and Associates are actively working for the betterment of all of us seniors trying to age in place and searching for the best health care and information that we are entitled to in our golden years. Most women my age would not easily blurt out how old they are, but from my heart, I wanted to say how much equality, diversity, and acceptance Chesapeake Hearing Centers has always been known for with both their patients as well as their employees. Since the day I started working for them in 2009, when I was a mere 67 at that time, this year our practice is 46 years old and I am now 78 and still going strong. Um, as I continue to learn and grow, I still have the same values but even more respect and admiration for elder care, 
hearing health care and the interest of all of us seniors each and every day. Thank you for this opportunity once again. And now my distinct honor is introducing you to Dr. Rapp. Thank you. Thank you, Maris. That'd be nice if I could get introduced like that every time I see a patient. Be a nice one. <laughs> uh, so thanks for uh, for joining us today. Thanks to Elville uh, for the library system. This is uh, this is great. I'm so glad we have this many people here. This is fantastic. Uh, so what I want to do today is really uh, dive in deep about uh, how we hear, how hearing impacts us all, uh, and try to give everybody a little bit more information. Uh, so Maris already. Kind of went in uh, to detail about my background. You don't want to hear about that. I won't bore you. Uh, but I'm an audiologist at Chesapeake Hearing Centers. Uh, we're the oldest private practice in Maryland. Uh, we have seven offices that range from Columbia all the way down to Ocean City. Um, so we're, we're all over the map in, in Maryland. Uh, we provide uh, diagnostic care. Uh, so basically hearing testing, uh, hearing aid fittings. We also test bat the balance system. Uh, so 75% of your balance is controlled from your ears, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, like I said, we do work with hearing aids. Quite a bit of patients wear hearing aids with us. Uh, and we see all ages, pediatrics to, uh, to all ages, and birth to 105. Uh, so what are our goals today? Just so we can set these out early so you know what to expect. Uh, so I want to go over just exactly how do we hear, um, how sound is uh, plays into our social life, and how it also impacts not just ourselves, but our family members and our friends. Uh, what happens if you can't hear? Why does it matter, right? That's the whole point of this presentation, I would say. Uh, ways to enhance communication and listening skills. Uh, and then we can take a little bit of a dive into uh, the latest developments in hearing technology out there, some hearing aids. And most importantly, if you have questions, uh, there's time for that as well. And also don't hesitate if you do have questions, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, that's, that's great to have a little back and forth. I don't want you to wait to the end, um, unless you feel more comfortable doing that. So if you do have a question, just, just put it in the chat. Uh, so I always like to start off with this. Uh, I think this, this comment kind of uh, really solidifies what a lot of us uh, experience from time to time. Uh, so we've all been sitting on a couch talking to somebody or you know, sitting in a room grabbing coffee, watching TV, and you have a conversation and you hear something and there's no way that person actually said what, what you heard. So in this case, where this woman's saying, no, I think, I think you need a hearing test. And he's saying, why the heck do I need a hairy chest, right? I'd never see this in my office, of course, right? Uh, so I always uh, tell my patients at first, you know, part of hearing loss is marriage counseling because of this. Uh, but this is quite often uh, what we hear, right? So uh, you, the problem is that you can't, you're not mishearing everything, but you're mishearing important words here and there. And that's a really uh, big red flag to us that, that your hearing is starting to deteriorate. And it's a good time to come in for a hearing test. Um, so that's something that we call a sound void. Uh, like I said, it's probably the most, uh, most popular thing that we see in the office, the, the most reoccurring theme. Those moments where they're just lacking clarity, right? So you hear uh, somebody say, hey, can you grab me that hat? We don't have a cat. What are you talking about? Uh, you just mishear those words. And that really does provide the meaning to the, most of the conversation. Uh, and so this is, like I said, the most, the most common complaint that we see. It's not that you're not hearing everything. It's just that you're missing pieces here and there. Um, so quite often what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask my patients, do you often hear people talking but have trouble in background noise, right? Do you have trouble hearing them and understanding them? Do you struggle uh, to hear when you're in a restaurant or if two or three people are talking at one time? Those are usually sound voids. Uh, and so you're not alone if that's something that you experience. Part of uh, what's happening when we're actually listening to conversations uh, and, and words and speech and sounds is that our brains are always looking for different patterns, right? Our, our brain is looking for a pattern in all the sounds that it hears and trying to piece together what exactly that person is trying to say. So some of you probably have a heads up if you looked at the PowerPoint, but if you take a look at that, uh, that picture, does anybody see what that pattern actually is? I'll give you a second, it's rhetorical because I know no one's microphone is on. <laughs> but if we look, that's actually a Dalmatian. I assume it's walking outside, I don't know. Uh, but I like this because it really tells us about what we're hearing, right? So if we think about 
what how we actually interpret speech and we interpret sound vowel sounds they provide us the, the volume of speech right they let us know someone's talking the consonant sounds they let us know they're the meat and potatoes right they're letting us know exactly the difference between hat sat cat that fat right so in this case the black and white are the vowels and the color are the consonants right the color really makes that pop it makes that dalmatian come out and that's how we can tell that that's a dalmatian in the outside of the background there if you're having hearing loss one of the things that we most commonly find is that the the hearing loss typically will occur in those higher pitch sounds so those if you think about a piano those higher keys that uh you know at the end of the end of the keyboard they tend to be associated with those sounds like s and f and th and k and that's really where we start to miss uh, the, the bulk and the meat of the conversation. And we're gonna talk a little bit uh, later about what happens when, when we're missing those things. So if you are missing those sounds, how does that impact you? And uh, we're gonna talk about that in, in greater detail. The first thing I wanna talk about though uh, is exactly how does your ear work, right? So uh, your ear has three components. So you have an outer ear, a middle ear and an inner ear. The outer ear is the one that everybody knows, right? It's your, it's the piece that sticks out of your head. It's called the pinna. Uh, and then you have the ear canal and that's the part where wax will grow uh, or build up. It's also the part where, uh, you know, you if you use a Q-tip, uh, raise your hand. I'll be calling the cops, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so uh, you can, <laughs> Q-tips aren't the end of the world, but just try not to push them in too deep. Uh, but that's also uh, where the majority of if wax is building up in there, you can get some hearing loss that way. Quite often we will see that in our office. Uh, patients will come in and they'll say, oh, recently I've, I've noticed my hearing has gone down. It sounds muffled. It sounds plugged up. Quite often there will be wax in there and we'll need to take that out. Behind the eardrum, you'll see there's three little bones there, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. That is the middle ear. Uh, that's also where if you get an ear infection or if we have allergies and you feel plugged up, usually that's where there's some pressure or fluid buildup back there. Uh, and then the third part is the inner ear. This is the part that does not receive any glory or fame, but it's the most important part to us as audiologists because this is actually how it functions, right? How your ear uh, actually sends all the sound and interprets all the sound. So if you take a look at that, uh, there's a part that says the cochlea. It looks like a little snail shell. That's actually how we hear. The component a little bit on top of that, northwest, I guess, uh, there's three little canals, the semicircular canals. That's actually what controls balance. So I said earlier, 75% of your balance is controlled from your ear. That's mm -hmm. where that's coming from. Um, and so quite often we will find that if you have hearing loss, you may also have some instability issues as well. Inside of that little snail shell, that, that area called the cochlea that I just referenced, uh, there are thousands and thousands of little tiny hair cells. They're microscopic. Uh, and each of those hair cells, think about them like a piano key or a guitar string or not very musically inclined, but if you could think about them being tuned to each individual pitch, right? So if you see in a normal ear, they're all standing upright, they're all standing erect, kind of like soldiers in a line, right? And as the sound comes in, they all, they all kind of move around right? But the damaged cells, hair cells, they're, they're slightly wilted, right? Um, they're, they're not working as hard, they're stressed out, uh, and unfortunately, once those hair cells are damaged or dead, they can't come back. Uh, and what you'll notice is that you can see that there's a few that are still the full length, but then in the background, you'll see that there's a few that are just little nubs. And we're not quite sure about this, but what we do think is that those hair cells actually just break off and they die. And, and there is no coming back once that happens. So, sorry for all the doom and gloom. Uh, so this is a hearing test. So when you actually come into the office, and I like to put this slide up here because it, it really shows you where the speech sounds fall. So I want you to zero in on that yellow kind of banana looking air, uh, the shaded region. So that actually is gonna show you generally where each speech sound is going to fall on this graph, right? So on the left side where you see uh, the number zero down through 120 as you go down the screen that is volume at the very top very quiet and then as you go all the way down the graph that's very loud right so 
you can see it's going from rustling leaves all the way down to the sound of a jackhammer or a jet engine. And as you go across from left to right, that is more like a piano. So those lower bass tones are on the left and the higher treble tones are on the left or on the right, I'm sorry. Anything just for argument's sake above that 30, where it says 30, 30 decibels and above is normal, okay? We would expect your hearing to fall in that range. But uh, I had said earlier that for the most part, we tend to find that people with hearing loss in our, in our offices tend to have more higher pitched hearing losses. So those higher pitch sounds, like K, S, H, F, S, T, H, those sounds can become more muffled. And you can also see one thing that I always like to point out is those birds chirping. I don't know if you can see that where it says 10 over near 8,000. Um, quite often patients will tell me once they get hearing aids that they can hear other things that enrich their lives, right? So the birds chirping, right? They can hear other people talking, kids laughing, and those type of sounds uh, do bring enrichment to your life. Also whispering. So if you like to gossip, you can, you can hear that and you can hear what everyone else is doing. Uh, so there's two main types of hearing loss. So there's a sensory neural hearing loss or a conductive hearing loss. And quite often when patients will come into to the office, they just fall into one or the other. Uh, sometimes it's both, but most, most of the time it's one or the other. So if we go back to that screen where uh, you had the, the graph of the ear, the map of the ear, a conductive hearing loss is going to be a hearing loss that's temporary. Um, it's usually caused by wax in your ear. And once we get that wax out, then the hearing loss is gone, right? It's, it's caused because there's something blocking the conduction of sound to the inner ear. Uh, sometimes it does require surgery, right? So sometimes there are bones in your ear that can be dislodged. We'll see this often from car accidents or head traumas, a fall, um, you know, whiplash can cause those bones to move. Uh, and that may cause a conductive hearing loss. The other is called sensory neural. And what we know from that is that that is a permanent hearing loss. That is when those hair cells, you know, they're, they're standing upright and then they start to wither away. Uh, that is, again, permanent. And that is something that we tend to see as we get older. Actually, there's some research that says after the age of about 25, uh, we start to experience at least some degradation of those of, of, uh, hearing function. So again, hate to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, so inside of that, there are some other categories of hearing loss. So there's something called presbycusis. That's the most common. All that really means is just age-related hearing loss. Um, there are genetic hearing losses. Uh, so some people are just predisposed to having that hearing loss. Typically, it's passed down from your mom. Uh, so the mother usually will pass that down to, uh, to her kids. And there are certain hearing losses that also skip generations uh, just based on genetic sequencing. Uh, some patients will have sudden onset of hearing loss. So I've had some patients that have had uh, some, they've been sick, they get a virus, and then all of a sudden their hearing is gone on one ear. Um, that may or may not be able to be uh, returned back to normal. Sometimes that requires uh, a steroid injection or some sort of treatment, but uh, that is something we definitely need to monitor over time. Uh, just as a side, we've noticed that some patients, and we've actually noticed quite a few patients that have had COVID have experienced sudden onset of hearing loss and onset of ringing in your ears, tinnitus, and it's usually just on one side. So we're we'll, curious to see how that plays out over the next few months or years with, with COVID patients, hopefully not that long. Um, there's also noise exposure. So patients who have been in the military, who do landscaping, uh, construction work, you know, those repeated loud sounds, that, can, that is known to cause hearing loss. And then other things uh, like chemotherapy, medications, radiation, we know that that can also have a, an, an outsized impact on hearing as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about presbycusis because that is, like I said, the, the most common type of hearing loss. Um, like I said, after the age of about 25, that starts to, to, uh, to go out on us, right? And it can happen gradually. Most of the time, you don't even know you have hearing loss uh, for several years, right? Uh, 48 million Americans do suffer from presbycusis, and there's no normal loss for an age. So that is one of the most common questions that I get, where patients will come in and say, well, is this normal for my age? You know, I'm, I'm 60, I'm 70, I'm 80. What is that normal? There really is no normal hearing loss. Um, I have some patients that are 40 years old and have severe hearing loss, and I have some patients that are 90 and have only a slight mild hearing. 
So it, it does vary from person to person. Uh, but prevalence wise, we know that 14% of uh, people over the age, from the age of 45 to 64 have hearing loss. That's about a third of people over the age of 65. And then two out of three people over the age of 75 experience hearing loss as well. That's a, that's a pretty big number. More people than both. Uh, so what are the consequences of hearing loss? So, so we know what's causing hearing loss. We know what type of hearing loss it could be, but, but what happens when we do have hearing loss? So when we talked about hearing being, uh, you know, th this very social sense, right? It's what connects us. It's what allows us to, to talk with our loved ones, our spouse, our kids, you know, our grandkids. But when you can't hear them uh, or you have to ha keep asking them to repeat themselves, uh, quite often patients will tell us, they feel shame, they're embarrassed by this, and it angers them, right? They don't wanna to have to keep repeating themselves. Uh, they can start to withdraw, they start to become sad, right? We know that there is increases, increased amounts of paranoia, right? So you think people are talking about you because you can't hear it, right? So you just assume they're talking about you because everybody's laughing and they're looking at you to be part of the joke and you can't hear what they're talking about, right? So that also allows you to lose confidence. And that is one of the, the things that we really strive to do with our patients is just to make sure you're advocating for yourself, right? There's some other issues with relations or, you know, with our, our loved ones, our, our husbands and wives and kids. Uh, you can become inattentive. Um, you don't necessarily participate in the same groups you once did. You know, maybe you were part of the Lions Club or you went to, you were in a bowling league and now all of a sudden you can't hear, and because you can't hear, you're not part of the group anymore, so you just stop doing those things. We don't want you to withdraw, but that does happen. Um, and quite often you'll become more, patients will become more irritable, um, and they become isolated. So, I, and I've seen it you know, time and time again with patients where they do start to withdraw and they're not part of the, part of the conversation. And what we worry about is then if you're not part of that conversation, that you can actually cause more hearing loss. You can actually cause nerve damage. And that's what we're going to talk about next, actually. So there are some cognitive issues that we do know are related to hearing loss, right? And one of the, one big question that we always get is, you know, is there a relation between Alzheimer's and dementia and hearing loss? And while having hearing loss does not make you uh, get dementia, right? Uh, we do know that there is some sort of, some correlation to increased cognitive decline. But one caveat that I always like to throw out is that it can easily be confused for hearing loss and vice versa. So what we don't know is, did, did grim, you know, grandma, did you not hear me because your ear didn't work? Or did you not hear me because your, your brain wasn't able to process that, right? Or if, you know, my brother is just nodding along and just pretending like he heard me, is it because he was busy thinking about something else or because his ear didn't register it. You know, there's a lot of questions that go with that. Uh, we do know that there is a 30 to 40% uh, decline in cognition tests when patients have untreated hearing loss. So they did a study actually at Johns Hopkins where they followed people with very similar hearing loss profiles and they took cognition tests over time. I believe it was over five years. And what they found was patients who did not do anything about their hearing loss scored 30 to 40 percent worse, meaning that they lost 30 to 40 percent of their cognitive function because they did not treat their hearing loss. We also know that you're also devoting more time, more brain power to basically try to try to listen, to try to comprehend and process what you hear. So I always liken this to renting space in your brain. Right? So you have a part in your brain that focuses on hearing. You have a portion of your brain that focuses on attention and processing and comprehension. Right? And when you have a hearing loss, you're, you're working extra hard to hear those things and to fill in those gaps. And you basically have to lease space from those parts of your brain. So if, if you are now reducing the capacity to focus and to pay attention and to comprehend, now you're really causing a real dilemma when you are in a group setting and you're trying to multitask, right? And all this really, the studies have, have come together and shown that cognitive function uh, does decline with hearing loss uh, and that hearing aids can at least try to plateau that.
I know that's a lot to go over in one slide. So everybody's brain is unique to them. Um, it processes speech and sound differently. So one of the things that happens is that I showed you that cochlea, that, that part of the inner ear that actually processes the sound. What that does then is it, it sends the signal to the brain through the auditory nerve. So there's a nerve connection between your ear and your brain, right? And what we wanna make sure is that that nerve is functioning fully, right? Uh, over time, if you're not using it, I had mentioned that you become isolated, you start to withdraw. We do know that if you're not using that nerve, it can begin to atrophy, right? And you know, if I walked around all day and I, I kept my right arm in, in my pocket and I walked around for a year like that, and then a year later, somebody asked me to throw a football, I wouldn't be very good, right? Because that my, my nerve and muscle memory is not there. So we do become concerned about cognitive decline and hearing loss together. Uh, and then this also is why, you know, because the brain is so individualized and everybody's uh, reaction to hearing loss is, is different, this is why there is so much variance and why some people benefit more from hearing aids, right? Uh, some people do better in speech and some people don't. So one thing that I always caution patients on is don't, don't really compare yourself to other people, right? You are your own person, you're your own individual person, your brain and your ears, they're yours. And so that uh, really is important that we, that we don't compare ourselves to others. So what else is connected with hearing loss? So we do know that uh, people with hearing loss are three times more likely to fall. I think that is one of the biggest, biggest things other than cognition. So we know that 75% of your balance is controlled from your ears, right? Uh, and we know that two out of three people over the age of 75 has hearing loss. And we, we generally know that about a little less than that has uh, also has instability and some balance issues. Maybe not vertigo, but some instability. And so we do know you're more likely to fall because of that. Um, obesity. So people who are obese have an increased of, uh, risk of hearing loss, especially in women. Diabetics are twice as likely to report hearing loss. Uh, and we know that this is also related to heart health because the, the ear has a lot of blood flow. It's highly vascularized. There's a lot of blood in there. And we know there's uh, variations in blood pressure that that can cause hearing loss as well. So hypertension would be associated with that as well. Uh, we also know that you have a 70% greater risk of having hearing loss as a smoker, as opposed to someone who is a non-smoker. Um, there are doing some research to see what happened if I quit 40 years ago. And the numbers are really actually bearing out that even if you did smoke, it's maybe not 70% greater, but you still have a higher prevalence. Uh, from the research that I read, it's 30 to 40% more, even if you smoked years ago. Dr. Rob? Yeah. We have a question from one of our good friends here at the firm. Yeah. And the question is, is hearing loss genetic? Can you speak to that? I can. Hearing loss, yeah, so hearing loss can be genetic. And in fact, uh, so there are some people who are born with hearing loss, and we, we know that that typically is genetic, almost all of that is, is genetic. But we also know that there are some people who just have a faster rate of decline in their hearing as they get older, and that can also be genetic. So typically, uh, we know that hearing loss can be passed down from, from the mother, right? So if, if your mom had hearing loss, there's a good chance you'll have hearing loss. Uh, and that's not to say that, that fathers can't pass it down, but hearing loss tends to be a trait that, that moms tend to pass down. So it is hereditary. I hate to tell you <laughs> if, uh, that, that that is something that you definitely want to keep an eye on. And that's something we're actually going to talk about a little bit later when uh, what we suggest is actually that everybody over the age of 50, and in fact, that number is getting younger now, actually monitor their hearing, just like you check your eyes. Um, that, in, you, that you would check your ears because we are finding more and more people have a, a hereditary hearing loss like that. Uh, so the hearing does impact your quality of life, right? So your personal connections with people, uh, spending time with your family. I can't tell you how many times I've had patients come in and say, you know, this, what I really want to do now is I want to do something about this because I just had my first grandkid and my grandchild and I can't hear them. Right. Or, uh, you know, my, my grandchild came up to me and made fun of me because I couldn't hear what she had to say. Or I'm going to my son's baseball game or musical and I can't hear what's happening. All right. So we know that this does have an, an outsized impact on on your family. Right. It doesn't just impact you. 
right? So when you have hearing loss, quite often what will happen is other people will catch on before you do. Because when you can't hear, you just assume nobody could hear, right? But other people know you better, typically. Uh, and when you are having them repeat themselves, they're gonna notice it, right? Or other people might notice that you're withdrawing more. Uh, and so it is always a back and forth uh, in the office to, I, I always recommend bringing somebody in with you because they can offer another perspective. And it's certainly not about them, right? So when you come in the office, we, we're focused on, on your hearing and it's not to attack anybody, but it is quite often they will they will notice it prior to you noticing that your, your hearing loss is impacting you, right? And it can also be a safety issue. You know, you need to hear those smoke alarms. You need to hear a doorbell right, or a, the phone call when you're outside walking. You know, the weather's getting nice outside. If you're outside walking, you want to be able to hear a car coming up behind you, right? Uh, and this is really an issue, especially if you have hearing loss in one ear, where you, you're going to have trouble locating where sound is coming from. So if you're walking on the street, you want to make sure the car is coming behind you and you step out of the way of the vehicle instead of, you know, the other way. So it does become a safety issue. One other really big issue that we run into is tinnitus. Uh, and so I'd say that around 48 million Americans have presbycusis. So that's anyone over the age really of, of 60. Uh, but about 50 million Americans across the whole population has some form of tinnitus or tinnitus. And that's 10 to 15% of the whole population, right? That's a, that's a big number. That number does jump up significantly for veterans, right? So if you're, a veteran, you're, you have a 60% chance of, of having ringing or buzzing in your ears. And it can come in all shapes and forms, right? So I have some patients that say, yeah, I just hear a little bit of ringing in your ears. It's not a big deal. I have some patients that hear cicadas, railroad tracks, music. Um, you can hear some sort of uh, like a pinging noise. Some people, doesn't bother them at all. It's just part of their life. Other people, uh, you know, they, they need to do something about it. I have patients who are in therapy because of it. Um, and it really does run the spectrum. And one thing that I always, always caution patients about is if you see changes in your mood or your personality, you need to seek help immediately because that is something that uh, can, can really wreak havoc on you psychologically. Um, one thing that we do know is that that it can be caused by medications, almost any medication, including Tylenol, Advil, if you look into the side effects, can cause at least uh, temporary tinnitus. Um, it can come from noise exposure. Again, genetics can play a part here. So uh, some people are just more predisposed to having that. One thing we also know is that stress can make it worse. But we also know that nicotine, caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco, all the things you do when you're stressed out, can also make it worse. So it is a vicious cycle there. Um, so it, what we try to do is try to find what triggers it for, for each individual person and see if we can limit that impact or that effect. Some things like uh, a high salt diet and uh, MSG, that can also cause, cause issues. And that does vary from person to person. So if you have hearing loss, we know you have hearing loss now. We know you, you're having experiencing hearing difficulties, um, that it, it's impacting not you, not just you, but everybody else. Uh, what can you do? Uh, hearing aids are an op option. They're not the only option, but they are. They can offer dramatic improvement for, for patients with hearing loss. But one thing that we do know is that there are 15 million Americans who refuse to seek help for hearing loss. That's a huge chunk, right? And only 16% of physicians are actually routinely screening for hearing loss. And this is according to the American uh, Medical Association. So we know that if we're not, we're not screening for it and people are really relying on themselves but not really doing anything about it, there is a large section of our population that is just not being helped in the hearing department, right? So what do we suggest? So I always suggest routine checkups. So when you are going to, if you're going to your doctor, make sure they're looking in your ears. Make sure they're looking for wax. And if there is wax, you know, some wax is, is good and normal. We want some wax in there, but we want to make sure that that wax gets removed if it's clogged up, right? If it's occluded in there and impacted, we want to make sure you take that out so you're hearing as best as possible. I also recommend annual hearing testing. 
especially for patients 50 and up. But uh, like I said, that's getting younger. So the CDC was making a big push for to uh, routinely screen people over the age of 60. And again, now we're actually finding that younger and younger patients are coming into our office. Now, certainly that can be impacted because we, we have the advent of newborn hearing screening. So we're catching newborn babies. We're screening people you know, and kids in school. But there's this this wide donut hole of patients from the age of 18 to about 60 that don't really monitor their hearing. Uh, and we definitely want to, to uh, fill that gap. One, one statistic that always jumps out at me is that it does take on average six, now it's almost seven years. Some of the latest research I've, I've read says that it takes about six to seven years to, and from the time you realize you have a hearing loss to the time you realize you have a problem. Right. And there are that's two very different things. I know that's just semantics, but it's a mental hump to get over from the time you realize, OK, I have this hearing loss, but now I want to do something about it. Right. And that's a decision only you can make. I, I often will tell my patients that they'll come in, they'll say, you know, I have a hearing loss. I don't want a hearing aid. That's fine. Right. I'm, I'm not we're not going to pressure you into that. You have to be prepared for that. That has to be something you want to do. And one thing that I usually will say is. Are you having problems? We know you have a hearing loss, but are you actually having a problem? And if you're not having a problem, then there's nothing for the hearing aid to fix, right? But you need to be honest with yourself. Uh, and, and I will always say you need to make sure if you're having trouble in situations you weren't struggling in before, that is a red flag. If, if multiple family members are coming up to you and, and, and asking you to at least get tested, that's something that you want to take into advisement, right? So what can you do if you don't have a hearing aid, right? You're, you notice that you're having issues in, in specific situations. Background noise is usually one. Uh, oftentimes patients will say, you know, when, when my wife's walking out of the room, I can't hear, right? Or my husband's talking to me two doors down and I can't hear what he's having trying to say to me, right? Masks have been a tough one, right? Who hasn't been to the grocery store or somewhere and someone's trying to talk to you and you just nod along and think, okay, I have no idea what you just said. And that, that's an issue, right? Um, so one of the things you can try to do if you're out at a restaurant, not that we are in restaurants right now, maybe you are, um, make sure you keep the background noise to a minimum, right? So you wanna sit with as much background noise behind you as possible so that your ears can try to help block that out. If you have a choice, you wanna sit in a booth. Uh, the booth is also gonna help to block out some of that sound. Or you wanna sit near a wall and make sure that you're facing the wall. So again, you have as much background noise behind you as possible. You wanna make sure you're in a well-lit room, right? So we know that, uh, and this goes along with face-to-face -face conversation. We know that at least 40% of the conversation we're having comes from lip reading, right? And so you wanna be in a well-lit room, face-to-face. -face. The other is that you wanna grab somebody's attention before you initiate conversation. So I'll give you a real world example here. So you are, you know, you're sitting down watching TV, uh, your wife's over here and she walks in the room and starts talking, right? You have a hearing loss, right? And so you're working harder to hear that TV and it takes you a second or two to turn your attention from the TV to her. And now she's three or four or five words into the conversation and you have no idea what she's talking about. So you just nod your head, agree to something and you have no idea what you've agreed to, right? <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that can be done in that situation is she should come in, tap you on the knee, say your name, anything to grab your attention from the TV to her. And now you're gonna pick up the majority of the conversation because your attention is now fo focused on her or should be. The other is advocate for yourself. If you didn't hear something, have somebody repeat it. One of the other, one little trick that I had learned is not just saying, what did you say? Because then patients or people will just get louder, just out of habit. They'll say, I said, and then they'll, they'll yell, right? But more volume or talking louder doesn't always make it easier to hear. So one thing you can do is say, can you say that a different way? Can you rephrase it, right? So if somebody says, hey, I'm going to the store, do you need something? And you didn't get that. They could say, hey, I'm going to the supermarket. Do you, do you want me to pick you up something? Or I'm going to the grocery store, right? So if you rephrase it, that's going to give you a few more context clues and you don't have to be blasted into outer space with somebody screaming in your ear, right? But if you don't say speak up for yourself, then no one's going to know you have a problem. 
And I, I find it all the time that patients who don't advocate for themselves tend to, in the long run, have more hearing loss and have more nerve damage because they're, again, they're, they're withdrawing and, and they're becoming isolated. So some common questions that I often get from patients is, you know, why can I hear some speakers better than others? Right. Uh, and that is one of the main things is that everyone's different, right? Some people have low voices, some people have higher voices, right? Males and females. So it depends where you fall on that speech spectrum that I showed you much earlier uh, before you guys fell asleep in that, that yellow banana region, right? The other thing is with masks, right? So some people, some voices will carry through a mask, others can't, right? So that, that has been tough. We have noticed it, it depends on the type of masks. Um, it depends if the person is speaking up. So those are some issues that are specific to today's time um, and we'll see how long that lasts. One of the other uh, big questions is why can I hear but not understand? Right? So I can hear you, but I didn't understand what you said. Right? And again, that's because those higher pitch consonant sounds are usually lacking. The other is that if there's some nerve damage, right? we know that if that nerve begins to atrophy, that's like playing a piano, but you're missing every third or fourth key. You're going to generally get the gist of the song, but you may not hear every, every key. Right? The selective hearing thing is probably the number one question <laughs> that I get. Uh, that just goes back to uh, the, the attention and the focus that we're, we're trying to focus more to overcome that hearing loss. Hearing loss can't be cured in most cases, um, and that's why there, we can manage it, but we can't cure it unless it, there's a surgical option for a conductive hearing loss, maybe, but that's a rarity. So I'd say probably in our office, you know, 95% of the patients we see can't be cured. Um, why can I hear people at a, another table, right? With all that background noise. So background noise, tend, if you have a typical hearing loss where you hear better, more volume, but not the clarity, you're gonna hear all that background noise and it's gonna come in and it, it's gonna overpower whoever you're sitting with. And it's gonna make it difficult to follow along with that conversation. And one of the others with, with it's kind of a, a late addition here, but the, the ringing in your ears is usually gonna be worse at night or when you are not doing anything. So most patients will say that if I'm busy, I can't hear it, right? So your brain is thinking about other things, but at night you're tired, your ears are taxed, the nerves been working all day, it just wants a break and now there's no noise to mask it out. And so that ringing is gonna most, mostly be worse at night, but not always. Uh, so there are some uh, tips when you are trying to find a hearing professional. Um, so there are three, three stool, uh, three legs to this stool, right? So there's you, uh, there's the professional, and then your family and friends. So I always tell patients when they come in, you know, th this is a team effort, right? You want to be able to hear better. Your family and friends want you to hear better, and they're going to need to support you as well. And they're going to need to be understanding, right? Because when you have hearing loss, even with a hearing aid, you're not going to hear every little thing, right? And the professional, you wanna make sure that you have somebody who's listening to you, who actually takes your needs into account and is individualizing everything for you. Uh, so I, at Chesapeake Hearing Centers, for example, you know, we have a team-based approach, right? So uh, we always put our patients first. We always try to make sure we're getting, we're getting our patients in, you know, when they call, that we're attending your needs. Quite often what we'll do is uh, we will participate in a program called Patients for Life, right? So you call in, we'll get you in, no questions asked, right? Within, try to, within a day or so, right? But you're, you're stuck with us, right? So, we're, so when you have a problem with your ears, we're gonna work with you to fix it. No matter how long you've had a hearing aid, if you don't even have a hearing aid from us, if you just have a hearing problem and you're coming from someone else, that is our job, right? And so we're, we're there to, to put you first and, um, and see you through your journey with your hearing loss. You want to make sure that your hearing health care provider has, has education and experience. You want to make sure that they know what they're doing, obviously. Um, and that's one reason why uh, what I would encourage patients to do is just make sure that you're, you're doing a little bit of research, at least, um, on, on the, your hearing health care. Uh, you know, take some, some, some you know, take it by the horns and go in and ask the questions, right? If you have questions about hearing loss, ask them. Don't be afraid. Uh, if you have questions about hearing aids or anything, don't be afraid, ask. You know, you don't want to be, the worst thing that could happen is you get a hearing aid and it has problems and you don't want to go back, right? So then it's not really helping you out much. 
So speaking of hearing aids, we just did all that. I, I do want to talk a little bit about what is new out there. Um, so hearing aids are much more discreet than they used to be. Um, they can be all the way inside of the ear. They can be behind the ear. Uh, they're rechargeable now, so they don't involve batteries. Uh, they allow you to connect to your smartphone. So if you have an iPhone or an Android or an iPad, um, you can connect and there's a little remote control app there where you can adjust the volume and make changes. It's pretty nice. But one of the, the biggest changes aside from all that is that the hearing aids now are much more automatic than they used to be. So they can self adjust for the most part. So if you are in a crowded room versus a, a quiet, you know, you're just sitting at home watching TV, the hearing aids are going to react much in a different uh, level. Um, they can also uh, stream your phone calls. Um, they can have a fall detection or fall detector. So if you do fall, one of the nice features is you, it will send an alert as a gyroscope inside. So if it knows that there's a sudden move, it can send a text alert to three different people um, on your list. Uh, and it can, we can also remote in. So if you're having problems, this has become um, quite popular with the pandemic. If you can't get into the office, we can remote into the hearing aid and make changes uh, depending on the cell phone that you have, which is, uh, has been a, a godsend for some, some people. All right, uh, so with that, I think I've bored you all enough. If anyone has any other questions or con concerns about anything, now's the time. Well, thank you, Dr. Roth. And I wouldn't say that was boring at all. Um, <laughs> on the contrary, uh, a lot of really great and important information and really loved your presentation style. Um, we have dozens and dozens of presenters here in our webinar series and you are certainly one of the very best so thank you <laughs> well i appreciate um, it <laughs> i have a a couple of questions here and um, to everybody out there now is your time to get those questions in and i know um, there are some questions that you have in your minds out there so please send them in to me um, right now please um, the first question we have is vertigo related to hearing loss so vertigo itself is not uh caused by hearing loss but we do know that uh, balance and hearing loss do go together um so there are quite often there will be something um inside those let me go back to this slide making me work for this one <laughs> so on this screen um that little that cochlea that i talked about has those three little rings attached to it there are little calcium crystals that sit inside of there and they act like a level, right? So when we move side to side, front to back and, and at an angle, they move with us and they tell us where we're at. Sometimes they get dislodged in the wrong tube. And that is something that is actually, uh, there's a simple maneuver that can be done. It's called an Epley maneuver. And we, that's something that actually an audiologist can do, a physical therapist can do. Um, but that is something that can be, can be fixed. It's about 85% effective the first time, 92 the second. But vertigo itself, uh, if it's not associated with those crystals, may be related to hearing loss. And we tend to find that it's usually just on one side. There's a test called a VNG, video nystagmography test, um, that I, we, we do with patients where we can try to, try to see which ear is causing the issue. Um, and then we can try to zero in on that. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have hearing loss, but typically it's going to go hand in hand. Another question, somebody thinking about hearing aids, do hearing aids have to be worn all the time or is it just based on personal preference? Um, what are your thoughts about that? That is a great question. Uh, so I always suggest patients wear them from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. Uh, one thing that we know is that it takes a while to acclimate to the new sound, right? Because your ear is used to hearing the way it's heard, right? It's normal. Now, when we add in a hearing aid, we're changing how that sound is, right? So it's not normal anymore. So it takes a few days to get used to it. What we will find is that patients who take them in, put, you know, put them in, take them out, put them in, take them out, uh, is that you're going to have a very hard time once you get into background noise because your ear is not going to be used to it. So the first time you go out to a, a, a restaurant, it's going to be tough. And the hearing aid's not going to work because you're just going to put it in, but your ear isn't acclimated to that new sound. So as I know it can be cumbersome at first, and it's it's definitely a task because you're changing your habit. But I promise that if you put it in from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, within a three days, you'll be good as new. Okay, and that 
maybe relates to a personal question I have. I know somebody that recently got hearing aids and I don't think is overly satisfied with them. And I'm not sure of the exact reasons behind it. Um, is that possibly because the person is not wearing the hearing aids all the time, not having given them a chance? Or what do you as a professional typically see as reasons that people uh, have for not being fully satisfied with their hearing aids or having to come back to you with their with problems with their hearing aids? Yeah, so it, it can be a number of things. Certainly, if you're not wearing them regularly, that that's one that's definitely going to cause an issue. Um, just, you know, I can only speak to what we do, but this is, I think that this kind of lines up with that question. For example, what we always suggest is I always have my patients come back every one to two weeks in the beginning. Um, and you have as many follow-ups as you need when you get fit with a set of hearing aids. So quite, you know, I, I don't think I've ever fit a patient where they haven't needed an adjustment at least once, right? And everybody's ear is different. It's why some people like certain musics and music and other people hate it, right? Some people are annoyed by nails on a chalkboard and some people could care less. So some ears are a little bit more sensitive to certain sounds, so they need to be adjusted in a different manner. And it really depends on the person. So uh, there are some tests that, that we recommend being run. They're just best practices. So when you get fit with a set of hearing aids, there's something called speech mapping or real ear measurements. And that's just making sure the hearing aid is doing what it's supposed to be doing and making sure the hearing aid is actually uh, amplifying the sounds that it needs to. Um, that usually will do the trick, uh, but it, it can come back down to, I have some patients that just need to come in weekly at first so we can build up that sound slowly over time so their ear can get adjusted. Uh, I also have my patients, if, they, if we're running into an issue where it's just not working in certain settings, try to write down what, where they're having specific issues and then we can try to find out, you know, what, what do the acoustics look like there? What are, what's the sound? What's going on? What, why are we having this issue? And we can try to individualize it that way. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question that just came in. What does insurance typically cover? Hearing aids or tests or both? Mm -hmm. So insurance will typically cover uh, the, the test. So the test will definitely be covered. Uh, hearing aid coverage is is a different animal so it depends on the insurance um it i very rare that the hearing aids themselves are completely covered unfortunately you know medicare does not consider them to be medically necessary but uh we we do submit to insurance um, a, a significant chunk of our patients actually do have an insurance benefit with hearing aids um so that is something that we we check but i i can't tell you you know that there's no blanket answer for that, uh, but there's a large number of insurances that will have at least some benefit. Okay. Yeah, and this is maybe a more individualized question that yeah. uh, the person would have to call in to you to ask, but are you an Aetna PPO insurance plan participant? So don't know if that's something you can answer off the top of your head. Yeah, uh, so we will, uh, we should be, my, Tim, our president is on this, you may. <laughs> think otherwise but I yeah we we do participate with Aetna uh and okay. they, they do sometimes have an insurance benefit uh, again they will cover the typically will cover the cost of a hearing test um and they will sometimes have an insurance benefit now some insurance companies will have um, a benefit that is a self-submission benefit others you know it varied it varies from patient to patient but that is something that if you do have questions about that we're always more than happy to double check benefits for you that's that's part of what we do Thank you. Another question. I was a flight attendant and sat near the engines on takeoff and landing. I have certain pitches I can't hear. Will this get worse with age? Yeah, that is, that's actually a, a great question because I have a few uh, flight attendants as patients and they all have a very similar hearing profile. So uh, what's interesting is that uh, there's going to be some exposure to the noise, which is going to cause part of the hearing loss, but then we don't know how your genetics play into it, right? So I have actually found that most patients in that situation, and this is just a very specific situation that I just happened to have three or four patients like this, their hearing has not declined over time. So when they, they retired, um, they had a hearing loss and we've been following them. I don't want to say that is 
factual. I don't want to say that every uh, flight attendant in this situation is going to have this. I have just noticed that from my own experience. Uh, but it is important that if you know you have having those difficulties, that you are getting your hearing tested. And most importantly, that after you have that baseline, that you're monitoring it every year. Very good. Another question, how do you recommend we clean our ears at home? I've read not to use cotton swabs. Yeah, so I, I am definitely in the minority in the audiology field. Q-tips are not the end of the world, okay? But you definitely don't want to, you know, cotton swabs, you don't want to push them in all the way. Cleaning the outside of the ear, that's fine. Uh, but the, one of the easiest things you could do is when you're in the shower, just let some water run in your ear and then just use the wash rag and that should do the trick. If you feel like your ear is plugged up, if you're getting a, a big glob of wax out of there, you can use an at-home remedy, like even a, a cap full of peroxide, just pour that in your ear, let it sit for about 30 seconds, and then rinse it out with room temperature water. And that will usually do the trick. I have some patients that also like to do a half water, half uh, apple cider vinegar solution. The peroxide is gonna smell a little less. <laughs> okay. Here's a question. Shouldn't hearing be checked by a doctor who does not sell hearing aids, but advise on the different options? Yeah, that's also a great question. So uh, typically, so you definitely <laughs> don't want to go to a doctor that's only going to sell you a hearing aid. That is a great question. Uh, so I sp only speak to myself here. I have patients all the time that come in with hearing loss. We don't even broach the topic of hearing aids unless you know they're interested or we could just let them know it's an option. Uh, but you definitely want to go to a, a, a provider who's going to give you all the options in an unbiased manner. So that is absolutely correct. Thank you. And we have a comment here saying, I have hearing aids that improve my hearing of speech. Okay, thank you for that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, that, that was the comment. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Let me see. It looks like it's in two different parts. Let me, let me get to this here. It says, I have hearing aids that improve my hearing of speech, but music sounds all distorted. Mm -hmm. Is that common? It is. And that um, helps, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so music can can be tough. Music is one of the, the things that uh, most manufacturers of hearing aids are, are still working on. Uh, one of the problems that we run into is the goal of the hearing aid is to focus on speech and cut out other noise, right? But music is very intricate, it's very complex, and involves a lot of different tones, right? And so the hearing aid isn't sure which tones we're trying to cut out and which ones we're, we're not. Uh, there are some manufacturers now that are there. Some of the hearing aids that have come out are much better. They have improved them. Um, I, that is one that varies from patient to patient because music is so different from, from person to person. I have some patients that are happy with some with a music program that we can add in. I have some patients that would actually just prefer to take out their hearing aids to play the piano. Um, so that does okay. run, run the spectrum. And another question, can you shower and sleep in new products? I'm assuming discussing uh, hearing aids and the like. Yeah, so you don't, you don't wanna get them wet. Um, I would take them out when, you know, before you get in the shower, you don't wanna jump in the pool. They are water resistant now, they're not waterproof. I, I have had a patient run them through the washing machine and they live to tell the tale, so I wouldn't press your luck on that. Uh, but uh, they are much better than they used to be. Uh, you can sleep with them, but I always recommend patients take them out at night and either open up the battery door to save your battery life, or if they're rechargeable, that's when you'd wanna charge them when you're sleeping. Um, I do have some patients who have tinnitus or tinnitus and they will sleep with them in because hearing aids can help to mask out some of that noise. Uh, and in that case, they just have to find time either throughout the day to charge it or go with a, a battery powered option. Okay. Looks like somebody asked two questions in a row, so I'm going to ask them to you at the same time. Sure. What can you tell us about hearing over the phone? And are there technologies for the telephone other than the TDD type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the phone, uh, there's a few different ways. One thing you can try to do is uh, talk. So I'll just use my phone as an example. So if I turn, you usually hold your phone like this. But if you have a hearing aid that sits on top of your ear, you may want to just try to move the phone upward a little bit so that the speaker and the microphone can match up. 
right? Um, so that when you try to push it in, it may actually make it harder. So you want to move it upward so that those speaker and the microphone can actually sit near each other. Some of the newer technology actually allows you to stream your phone calls directly through both hearing aids. Uh, and for patients who don't have that, they have there's a hearing aid compatibility mode in most phones um, that has a little magnet in there that will give you a little bit of a boost. Um, but I do always recommend that patients, if they can, if they're at home, talk on speakerphone or an amplified phone. That that's going to be beneficial because you you know you have two ears. So if one ear misses something, the other ear is going to pick it up. Uh, but those are some of the things that we can do. And looks like the last question we have for now, Costco hearing aids have been highly rated. Do you have an opinion about them? Yeah, so so Costco is going to offer, they do offer um, similar technology. What they typically will tend to do, though, is for the most part, it's going to be previous generations of technology, but the premium levels. So you are getting an older generation at a less expensive cost, right? Um, one of the things you definitely want to look for in a provider is the follow-up care and the service. Make sure that's all included. Um, you know, with, with Costco, one thing you want to make sure is that you got to keep your membership. So if you don't have your Costco membership, they won't service your hearing aids anymore. Um, and so you just want to keep an eye on that. Uh, they won't do any custom products, unfortunately. So they, they can't do a custom made ear mold or they can't individualize the piece because they're just doing kind of the universal pieces to the hearing aids. Um, so you won't have that individualized piece, but they will have sometimes a, a lower price point because of that. Okay, so any other questions that you have? Um, now would certainly be your time to get them in. We're running at right about 11.30, a minute or two after. So again, wanna thank Dr. Rob, um, Maris, Walker, and Tim Milan, um, everybody at Chesapeake Hearing Centers, uh, just a wonderful presentation. And um, glad we got to um, get to know you here and we'd love to have you back for another presentation um, in the months to come. Please reach out to them, use them as a resource. Um, I, I know that uh, if, if I have a need, I certainly will and have family members that, um, uh, I will send their way. So just a couple things to note briefly um, for our webinar series. Uh, next Wednesday, we have Understanding a State and Trust Administration with Steve Elville. Uh, Wednesday the 21st, Estate Planning and Elder Law Essentials, again with Steve Elville. And Thursday the 22nd, a Financial Planning Aspects of Estate Planning with Olivia holcomb Volke. So three of our more popular webinars are coming up all in a row. So be sure to sign up online or uh, we'll be sending some invitations out for all of those. So it looks like we do have one more question that we're going to get to. Um, we have a lot of comments saying thank you for a great presentation. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, thank you for having us, too. And then, oh, of course. Yeah. That at the end, so I appreciate that. Anytime. Yeah. Um, love to have you back. So it, it looks like. That was great. I was impressed we with have the a, uh, questions. That was very nice. Tell us people. Can we do have one more. Yeah, we do have one more question here, um, and then I think we'll call it a day. Are amplifier devices any use or good? Yeah. So for some people, they are right. So if you have a mild hearing loss, uh, I have some patients or someone who has normal hearing, but it's just kind of teetering along there. I would suggest uh, sometimes an amplifier. Uh, but very rarely, uh, because an amplifier is going to be much like the volume on your TV. So you're going to turn all the volume up or turn all the volume down. A hearing aid is going to actually pinpoint each individual frequency or pitch, and it's going to adjust them individually, right? And it's also going to be a little bit more complex in that it can cut out noise. It can, the microphone beam can move around. Um, it can do more to make the speech sound richer versus an amplifier, which is going to turn everything up equally. Okay, great. Maris, do you have any closing comments or thoughts? I learned so much listening to Dr. Raup. Um, I listened to him a lot, and this was a wonderful webinar. And I also thank you. And thank you, Dr. Raup. Yeah, thank you, Maris. Uh, same with me. I, I listened to our attorneys speak. Uh, all the time, and I learn something new uh, on every webinar that I moderate. So 
uh, the feeling is mutual. So thank you again, everybody. Uh, we appreciate you being here. I'll also be sending a video out for today's webinar if you miss parts um, or want to hear again or share with family and friends. So uh, I'll send that out within the next day. So thank you for being here and thank you for your support of the Elville webinar series. We'll see you again soon. Take care. Thank you.